Okay, let's look at some more examples of this idea of confounding. Now we'll get into the realm of real data. And you'll see it's a little more subtle than that extreme example we saw before, but the ideas are the same. Here's an observational study. This was actually done in Nepali children, and one of the aims was to actually look at the relationship between arm circumference and height in Nepali children, look at how they were growing and how their anthropometric measures were correlated. And they wanted to compare these to other types of children from other populations. And let's suppose we looked at 94 randomly selected subjects from the study who ranged in age from three months to six and a half years. And they had had their arm circumference, weight, and height measured. So this study is clearly observational for trying to relate arm circumference to height, right? Our exposure is height. It's certainly not possible to randomize people to different height groups. So here's what we've got. We have a group of children. Their arm circumferences range from 11.6 to 16.5 centimeters. Their heights range from 57 to 109 centimeters. And their rates range from 5 to 18 kilograms. But to simplify how we look at this and to use techniques that we're familiar with from Stat Reasoning 1, to perform their analysis, we're going to dichotomize both height and weight at their median values. So even though they were measured continuously, we're going to turn them into binary indicators for both those measures. So for height, we will dichotomize height at the median, and subjects will be classified as less than or greater than or equal to the median height of 87 centimeters. And we could do the same thing for weight. So let's just take a look at the association, the RAW, R-A-W, the crude association between arm circumference and height with that grouping schema for height. Here's a box plot of arm circumferences by height. And certainly it's in line with what probably most of us would expect, that the distribution of arm circumference shifts up for the taller children. The median is larger as well as the 25th and 75th percentiles, etc., for those who are taller compared to those who are shorter. Although what's interesting to note is there's a little more variation in the arm circumference values for the lower or shorter height group. If we were to just try and summarize this uh, through a one single numerical measure of association, we're functionally wanted to compare some characteristic of a continuous measure, arm circumference, across two groups. So we might just create and calculate the mean difference. So if we do this, here are the results. The mean arm circumference for the group below the median height was 13.8 centimeters as compared to 14.5 for the group above the median height. So this is a mean difference of negative 0.7 centimeters for the shorter group compared to the taller. And this 95% confidence interval in this is negative 1.1 centimeters to negative 0.3. So this suggests that shorter subjects have an average arm circumference of 0.7 centimeters lower than taller subjects, but taking uncertainty into account, this could be anywhere from negative 0.3 centimeters to negative 1.1 centimeters lower on average. So it's a statistically significant result as well at that 0.05 level as the confidence interval does not include zero. However, it's not very hard to believe that arm circumference and height are also both related to child's weight. It seems like something we would probably think of right off the front. These are growth measures, and they tend to be somewhat associated with each other. So some of the relationship between arm circumference and height that we just saw could be because of or even masked by these behind-the-scenes relationships to weight. It's possible anyway. So how could we check this out? Well, just one thing to note here is that if we look at a box plot of arm circumference by weight group, there is an association, at least in the sample. The heavier children tend to have greater arm circumference. You can see that here. And I'm not going to look at a picture of the height-weight relationship, but it's, most of us would assume that there probably is one. So here's a possible diagram of the scenario, assuming that height-weight relationship also exists, that weight is related to both arm circumference and height and may explain some of the relationship we saw or may mask some of it in that area where all three circles intersect. So again, recall the original finding. Children below the median height had arm circumferences of 0.7 centimeters lower on average than children equal to or above the median height. So now to investigate whether this estimate is being fueled 
or even lessened in part by weight differences in the height groups and that arm circumference weight relationship, let's stratify by weight and re-estimate the association between arm circumference and height. So here's a table the mean arm circumference by height group, and we're only going to consider children in the lower weight group here. So we're stratifying by weight, and we're looking first at the lower weight group. And here's the data. You can see that the majority of the children below the median weight are also in the shorter height group, but there are some who are taller as well. But if we look at these results, it's kind of interesting. The mean arm circumference for these two height groups amongst the lower weight children are almost identical. The mean difference is 0.02 centimeters. So shorter subjects below the median weight have average arm circumferences of 0.02 centimeters larger than taller subjects below the median weight. And if you look at the 95% confidence interval, it's from negative 0.64 centimeters to 0.68. So almost nothing going on here between arm circumference and height among the lower weight children. The estimate made a difference in average arm circumferences is almost zero, and the confidence interval includes zero and is almost equally balanced on positive and negative possibilities. Now let's look at the same analyses, but done on the heavier children. And you can see that the majority of the heavier children are taller, but there are some in the shorter group as well. And although the mean arm circumference is higher in both these height groups than it was for the lower weight children, there's still little discrepancy in those height group specific means amongst heavier children. So you can see shorter subjects here in the higher weight group have average arm circumferences of 0.06 centimeters larger than taller subjects in the same weight group. So again, a very small observed mean difference. And then if we put a confidence interval on this, again, it includes zero and is almost equally balanced about zero, negative 0.9 centimeters lower to 1.0 centimeters higher. So just to put this all together, the original analysis we did, ignoring weight, Children below the median height had arm circumferences of about 0.7 centimeters less on average than children at or above the median height. And this difference was statistically significant. We saw a statistically significant positive association between arm circumference and height. Greater height was associated with greater average arm circumference. However, when we stratified this analysis by weight groups, children below the median height had arm circumferences on average marginally larger than children at or above the median height in both the weight groups. But in both the weight groups, these estimated mean differences in arm circumference were very close to zero and not statistically significant. So it appears as though the association between arm circumference and height pretty much disappears after we account for weight. So we could show those numbers and present the evidence of confounding, but you might say, well, John, if the uh, results are similar in the two weight groups, wouldn't it be nice if you could just present one overall weight-adjusted association? Let me just show you an example of how we might do that. Again, the crude unadjusted association was a mean difference, shorter to taller, in arm circumference of negative 0.7 centimeters. How could we do the adjusted association? Well, this is just FYI. And you can see how cumbersome it gets notationally, although the concept isn't that difficult. It's similar to what we did before with sample sizes. But one possibility we have is taking a weighted average of the weight-specific arm circumference height associations, and we might weight them by the inverse of the standard errors of these weight-specific associations. So what do I mean by the inverse, and why might we do the inverse? Well, remember, standard error is a reflection of the uncertainty in our estimate. So we want to give more credence or more say to estimates with less standard error than those with greater. Estimates with lower standard error are more precise. So by weighting by the inverse of the standard error, those with the greater standard errors, we take the inverse and they get less influence than those with the smaller standard errors. That's the idea. So here's a formula that shows how you might do that. We take each observed mean difference in arm circumferences between the shorter group and the taller group, for each of the weight groups, we do that times their 1 over the estimated standard error. And then we divide that by the sum of 1 over each of the standard errors. Turns out the standard errors of these estimates, which I didn't show you, but if you want to use the t-test I command, you could actually figure them out in each of the weight groups, are similar. 
And so taking a weighted average isn't much different than just averaging the two numbers, taking the weight specific associations, adding them together, and dividing by two. And it turns out to be about 0.04 centimeters. So in other words, after adjusting for weight, we estimate the average difference in arm circumference between shorter subjects compared to taller is 0.04 centimeters. And you can get a 95% confidence interval, and I'm not going to show you how here, but I may post something of an FYI for those who want to read, that goes from negative 0.3 centimeters to 0.38. So this result, the adjusted association vis-a-vis -vis this method, is qualitatively different than the unadjusted, and it's not statistically significant, whereas the unadjusted was. So this gives some evidence that weight was confounding the original association that we saw between arm circumference and height. Now again, I just showed you how to take a weighted average, but that's kind of a pain, and it gets cumbersome pretty quickly, and there's more, even more complicated ways to do it than I did that are slightly better. And if there's more potential confounders, and certainly with anthropomorphic measures, they probably are, we could spend our life stratifying. <laughs> you know, what about age? What about nutritional status? We could keep going. And how would we take into account more than one potential confounder at once? It can get very difficult by stratifying. So again, a better approach that we're building towards in this class is multiple regression methods. And that's what will really show how, how we can actually get these adjusted estimates. So I want to give you the flavor for what goes on behind the scenes, but we can worry about doing it ourselves when we get to regression. Just FYI, you might be thinking, well, John, if weight confounded the relationship between arm circumference and height, isn't it possible that the reverse was going on too? That height was also influencing the relationship between arm circumference and weight? There was crossover there. This is just FYI to finish the story. If you actually looked at the relationship between arm circumference and height, you can see the crude relationship here and then also the adjusted relationship and the weighted overall average height adjusted difference in arm circumference between the two weight groups was actually nearly one centimeter with a 95% confidence interval from 0.4 to 1.55 centimeters. So this is sort of interesting. After we accounted for weight, the relationship we saw between arm circumference and height all but disappeared. But taking into account height when considering the relationship between arm circumference and weight did very little to that relationship. In other words, when we adjusted for height, the arm circumference weight association was almost exactly the same as the unadjusted or crude arm circumference weight association. So this is an interesting case, but here's perhaps the picture of what's going on. Any relationship we saw between arm circumference and height was because of the behind-the-scenes influence of weight on those. However, it appears that weight is the real predictor of arm circumference, and height only has something to say about it through its relationship with weight. This isn't always the case. Many times when there is confounding between an outcome and two or more grouping variables, all of the adjusted outcome group relationships will differ. So the underlying potential confounders will confound each other's relationships. But sometimes one is confounded by the other, and the reverse isn't true because of a relationship like I just described. Let's look at one more example. This is an interesting example, and I actually took this from the journal Statistics Education. Somebody did a nice piece on this. It's real data, and it really illustrates the concept nicely. This is from a longitudinal study from South Africa, and this was a birth cohort. Children were actually, the information was recorded about them at birth, and they were followed up five years after birth. And one of the things the uh, researchers wanted to do, in addition to looking at some of the uh, health outcomes and given the birth status of these children, et cetera, was also to look at operational issues in doing a longitudinal study and wanted to see if they could figure out what was related to participation in the follow-up survey versus not so that in future studies they could build in that information to maybe get better follow-up rates. And so one of the things they looked at is whether or not the subjects who participated in the first part of the survey they looked at whether they participated in the follow-up by whether or not they had what is called medical aid at baseline when they gave birth, when the children were born. And what they found, the overall association looked like this. 
here's a two by two table looking at follow up participation stratified by whether or not the children's parents had medical aid at the time of their birth or not. What they found is that having medical aid was associated with reduced follow up participation. In other words, the the relative risk, if you will, here for following up sounds like a strange use of the term risk, but the relative risk of following up for those who had medical aid when they were born versus not was 0.7. They were 30% less likely to participate in the follow-up survey. And this was a statistically significant finding. The confidence interval ranges from 0.53 to 0.92. But one of the potential confounders or behind-the-scenes interferers is the race of the person. The majority of the participants in the study were what the researchers call black participants. That's how they classified their race. But there were also some non-black, which the researchers called white participants. So let's take a look at the results stratified by the researcher-designated race of the participants. So let's first look at the black participants. And if you actually look at the two-by-two table of follow-up participation and medical aid status at birth for those black participants, if you actually look at the relative risk of following up for those black participants with medical aid versus no medical aid, it's almost identical to one. In other words, there's absolutely no differential in the risk of follow-up between those with medical aid and those without among black participants in this sample. And the confidence interval includes one. It has to because our estimate is one and ranges from 0.76 to 1.36. Now, if we look at the same results, but for the white participants, we get a similar finding. The relative risk of participating in the follow-up for white participants with medical aid at birth versus those without medical aid, it's actually slightly positive. It's 1.05. But if you actually take into account sampling variability, it's not statistically significant, and the confidence interval ranges from 0.25 to 4.5. There's a lot of uncertainty here, but as you can see, there's very few white participants who actually followed up, and only two participants who followed up who had not had medical aid at the time of birth. So I'm going to leave this slide blank. See if you can recap the results in your own words, crude versus race-specific associations between medical aid and following up in the survey. But what's going on here? I'll give my verbal recap. We saw some sort of negative association. Those who had medical aid were less likely to follow up than those who did not have medical aid at the time of birth when we looked at everyone ignoring race. And that was a statistically significant decrease in the percentage of follow-ups. But when we took into account race, this association pretty much disappeared between having medical aid and following up, both for the black subjects and for the white subjects. So how could this happen? Well, let's again consider the role of race as it relates to the outcome of follow-up and exposure of having medical aid. Well, first of all, one thing to note was the majority of the sample was black subjects, 91%. You can verify these numbers by going back and looking at the pertinent tables. Now, let's look at the relationship between race and follow-up participation, or outcome of interest. Well, it turns out that a little over a quarter of the black subjects completed a follow-up as compared to only 9% of white subjects. So black subjects were much more likely to participate in the follow-up study in this sample. Now let's look at race in medical aid, and this is pretty striking actually, but only 1 in 10 or about 9% of black subjects in the sample had medical aid at the time giving birth as compared to over 8 in 10 of the white subjects. So what happened here Whites were less likely to participate in the follow-up, but more likely to have medical aid. And when we ignored the component of race here, it made it look like the having medical aid was associated with decreased follow-up. Interesting, huh? Well, hopefully these examples have helped give you some context for the idea of confounding, and we'll certainly be considering this again when we get into the multiple regression methods.